The title I think he gave this was uh, Can Government Be Public Sector Innovation, Can Government Be Saved? I, and I sort of want to reframe it. The question for me is like, I, I believe the only way that the country is saved is with public sector innovation. And I think that's probably some of what we're going to get to uh, tonight. This is a really important time, in my view, to be having this conversation. Uh, I think the challenges that we face as a country are so profound. And I think I, my experience was the most important thing that any governor needed to start with to be effective in office was a clear worldview about how the world around us is changing and what those changes mean for the people that we serve and what, what we need to do differently as a result. And for me, it was really about the two major forces at work on our economy, the one being that as a result of globalization, which by the way is not just rhetoric, the fact is employers have more choices than they have ever had before about where to hire people, and there are huge implications for all the people of our country as a result of that. And when you layer on top of that, automation, the fact that employers need relatively fewer people than they once needed, and specifically now with artificial intelligence, assuming the level of importance in our economy that it's assuming, I mean, it is, it is mind boggling. And there have been a lot, there's been a lot written on this in the last year, uh, year and a half about the number of jobs that will be impacted. I mean, people are all over the map. There have been some uh, very far reaching estimates that something like uh, 60, 70% of the jobs in the country, uh, you know, could be going away. McKinsey came out with a report more recently that it wasn't nearly that big, although a lot of jobs will be impacted. But I'll give you a real world story. I mean, I, when I was still governor, I, I stopped being governor in January. I was governor for eight years. And about a year ago, maybe 16 months ago, I got a phone call. I actually called a guy who was um, uh, the, the CEO of an insurance company. They were based out, out west, but they had about 650 employ employees in Delaware. And I read that they had uh, downsized in their, uh, in their office building from five floors to two. So I called the CEO to find out what was going on. And he said, well, we did, and it's because we've got, instead of having 650 people, we've got 450, and we're squeezing them into two floors. But unfortunately, you haven't seen anything yet. And it's not just about us, and it's not just about Delaware, but the, the software, the artificial intelligence, is getting so powerful and so strong and so much better <clears throat> than people can do it that when it, we're, going to be, we're going to be seeing so many more job functions, compliance, underwriting, and the like, that used to be done by people, and they won't be done by people any longer. And so for me, what this really meant is that we had to do, when you, when you combine those two factors, the, the fact that employers have more choices than they've ever had before with, this, uh, with the automation and, in, and the need for fewer employees, we had to do two things. We had to invest massively in skills, and we had to connect more effectively with the world. I was just telling Wynn at our, at our table, if you think about all the wealth that's going to be created around the world in the next 15, 20 years, something like 70% of it is not going to be created in this country. Now, we can bemoan that fact, we can complain about that fact, but I mean, it's real. And so it was my view that what that meant for the people of my state is we had to really work much harder to make sure that they get to participate as this wealth gets created elsewhere, through exports, through attracting foreign direct investment, and the like. You are in the Rhode Island Office of Innovation. Uh, what, are the, what are the key issues that you're focused on, the major challenges you're facing? So in the, in the Rhode Island Office of Innovation, we primarily focus our efforts along three policy areas. Um, one is around education, so how are we thinking about preparing our next generation workforce with the 21st century skills to be successful. We also focus on government innovation. So what are we doing internally to think about creating new processes, not just reinventing the old ones, that can really help transform our ability to serve residents and citizens in, in dramatically new ways. Um, and then we're focused on some technology aspects. So what are we doing to make Rhode Island an attractive place to pilot and test new technologies? How can we create advanced next generation networks? And how can we connect more of our residents um, to engage in that space. A stat that I actually found staggering was that 26% of Rhode Islanders don't have access to broadband in their homes. So when we think about the capacity um, and the fact that so much of what happens um, 
you know, really active way in terms of applying for jobs or as a student trying to fill out the FAFSA for federal aid and going to college. So much of that is happening online in a virtual space. How can we make sure that more of our residents have the ability to connect into that? So those are the, the broad areas that we're working on right now. Thank you. All right, so Laura, you worked with uh, Governor Bashir in Kentucky. I did. These two actually had, uh, Governor Raimondo here in Rhode Island is a phenomenal, phenomenal governor, one of the best. Governor Bashir in Kentucky, he and I overlapped for, I think, six years, and just a terrific guy. Uh, he really uh, gained a lot of um, uh, attention as a result of uh, Kentucky's implementation of the Affordable Care Act, which is sort of ironic given that, uh, you know, the politics in that state. But he was very bold, and I think to be a to be a Democrat in a very red state like that, he did not shy away. He and did not. No, he did, he did a great mm -hmm. job. Uh, you were secretary or head of finance and administration. Secretary of the finance and administration. Cabinet. Okay, so I think one of the main things you worked on, Kentucky being the kind of state that is very rural, um, you know, pretty spread apart, not a lot of population density in some of those areas, and connecting these folks to the modern economy uh, was a particular. Challenge. Project, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Jack. I also wanted to give a shout out to Holly Hopkins. She is here in the room today, and she was Governor Bashir's general counsel, and the reason that I am here. Um, she has come to these meetings for several years in a row and always comes back very um, energized. So, so I am Lori Flannery. I was the Secretary of Finance for the previous governor. I left that position almost two years ago. It would have been in December of 2015 that I left. And um, the two things, you know, the governor was proud of, of many things. We, we were lucky enough to have a lot of success in economic development after 2007 and 2008. Uh, that hurt everyone, but we came back very strong, and a lot of that had to do with the governor and how he focused on economic development. So Kentucky is, you know, a smaller state. We have about 4.5 million people. We are landlocked in the middle of the country. Um, and we have some challenges, but we also have some great things. The economic development that we have is possible because of where we are located. We are within 70% of, uh, we are within a day's drive of 70% of the United States, the continental United States. And so we have a lot of logistics and manufacturing and things like that. However, as you know, as you move forward, and Octavia was speaking about this, you know, it doesn't take a, you know, a, a, a MacArthur genius to, um, to understand that if you do not have a connected population with broadband in the home, you are really going to fall behind. And there's study after study that had been done about Kentucky's lack of connectivity. Um, they vary, uh, but they were all terrible, and Kentucky is always in the last five if you're looking at states uh, within um, the United States as far as having low connectivity, low access in general. Part of it's because we're a rural state. One study I remember in particular was in March um, and it was, it was in the Washington Post, which I pay more attention to because it was you know, mainstream um, news. And it had a very graphic list of it was actually global, and it, I think Delaware actually it was the highest state with the best connectivity. Yes, we are. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, <laughs> shout out. Um, but if you went through it, you could see this connectivity. So it was a line. It was so strong, and then you would get smaller and smaller and smaller as you went down. And there were probably 50 different uh, states and countries on that list, and Kentucky was second to the last. So we were last among the states, and we were second only to being last by the country Ku Kuwait. And the cool thing about that article, though, was it was talking about the project that I want to talk about because it said, you know, Kentucky is this far down, but there are some really innovative things coming around the corner that they're doing. What we did, and, and the governor, um, if you talk to him today, he believes the healthcare piece of it and the broadband piece were the two most innovative things he did. The broadband piece did not get as far as the healthcare piece simply because it was just something that happened later in the administration. Uh, and, and that has some ramifications actually to where the project is right now. So we call the project Kentucky Wired. And what is Kentucky Wired? Well, Kentucky Wired is going to be a statewide fiber optic broadband network. It is 3,300 miles long. It goes through every single county in Kentucky. 
So from an economic development standpoint, you are going to be able to very clearly tell people who maybe want to come to your state that you are going to be able to be connected with Kentucky Wired no matter where you go in the state. That's huge for us. We have something that's called the Golden Triangle, which is the more um, economically advantaged part of our state. And the western and the southern and the eastern parts, especially around Appalachia, uh, are, are lag behind a little bit. So it's nice to be able to say this is going to be in every single county. There are 1,100 connection points for Kentucky Wired. And those connection points are actually not fiber to the home or fiber to the business because Kentucky Wired is what's called a middle mile network. It is not a final mile network. And that's important for a couple of reasons. One of them is because government is going to serve itself. So the way it is right now, um, the Commonwealth pays whoever, whatever inter ISP, internet service provider around the state provides internet service in that area. And it, it varies widely, as you might imagine, between the Golden Triangle and the other areas for the connectivity. And the idea is that the Kentucky Wired Network, which touches every county so it can hit every single transportation office and health and family services office and library, you'll be moving that um, service from an existing incumbent ISP to this network. That will be the only time that you will have the final mile is when the government is serving itself. Uh, one of the other provisions that is unique is that it is open architecture. And we thought there are two provisions that come out of that. Um, it, 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 most are not open, and, and so, for example, there's an incumbent that wanted to say, you know, we would like to come in and purchase all of it, and we'll just we'll pay whatever price you want, we'll just purchase all of it. But we felt like one of the problems that we have is because there was not competition among the ISPs. Whenever you did have anybody that was providing service, which is not always in Kentucky, um, you often only had one, and obviously with a monopoly, you know where that leads you. That's, everybody knows how that, that works with a monopoly and, and typically with utility service. So we thought by having an open architecture and laying excess fiber that we would be able to sell that fiber. So the way the project is financed is that it is, um, com it, it, is it, um, it relies on what are called availability payments. That's public-private partnership language for usage fees. So for example, if you had a, a toll bridge, the availability payments would be the tolls that you would pay. Us, it would be the rent that you would be paying for the internet service. And the selling of the wholesale piece of it is something that we believe for the future is wonderful because it's going to allow the Commonwealth to be able to actually make money over the excess fibers. How expensive is the upfront investment? So the upfront investment is $324.5 million. 9% um, of that was financed through, um, we don't have any general obligation bonds in Kentucky, they're just revenue bonds. So 9% of that is financed through uh, state appropriation. 7% of it came from what are called ARC or Appalachian Regional Co uh, Commission, federal funds from um, Hal Rogers. And then the rest of it, 84% of it was financed. Again, this was unique even within a P3. Um, there was a gentleman on my staff, he was, he's younger and so he's, he was kind of uh, getting used to his job. He was a very bright young man uh, who was in charge of the Office of Financial Management. And when he was finally brought in, because we'd already done the procurement, which was a very interesting process, a very cross-agency process to make everybody feel like they were involved and to actually involve everybody, um, he was finally at the table after the technology and the procurement piece was done, and he kept thinking, why aren't we financing this through our conduit issuer, which is our economic development group? And he brought it up several times. Macquarie was not familiar with that. That's our vendor partner out of Australia that was chosen to do this P3 with us. Um, you know, in, in the United States, we have a municipal finance, but in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world, they don't really have that as a market like we do. And so uh, the P3 world was not used to that at all. And there was just this really a misconnection. And it finally got to the point where we were afraid that we were not going to be able to really get what we wanted out of the project from, a, from a, a, a negotiating standpoint. And finally, somehow, he got somebody on the Macquarie team to understand what he was talking about. Okay. And that's how we ended up doing the financing. All right, thanks. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch uh, topics here. It seems pretty clear to me uh, that people are generally disgusted with government. Um, they, they think it doesn't work. Um, sometimes they're right, sometimes it's perception. Uh, and so the question, uh, Octavia, why don't you start? I mean, what, what is it that those of us 
who are either in government, care about government, what is it that has to be done to, to change that narrative and to change that perception? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and it's something we think about often. Um, I think there's a, there's a culture shift piece that we need to understand in, in the approach um, that we take when we're thinking about silos that develop in government. I think Lori was speaking to this with getting, the, um, getting everyone around the table through the procurement process, and that's something that often doesn't happen in government. We kind of stay in our lanes, and then the perception that we're focused on, well, this is my job, and if it doesn't cross into my lane, I'm, I'm not gonna deal with it. I'm not gonna translate that and hand it off to the next person. In my experience, that's that's not the way that the majority of state government employees think about their work. They're really focused, they're action oriented, they're thinking about how can we serve residents in new ways. Um, and to get the bulk of the workforce thinking in, in those opportunity areas, so how can we bring together partners to the table who can help serve residents in new ways that are more meaningful and relevant. Um, I also think that there are important steps we need to take with respect to technology um, and the way that we're used to engaging um, in, our, in our world. So the, th you know, the thought of going to the DMV and waiting in a long line when I'd prefer to just kind of do something easily on my phone um, is really frustrating as a resident. So how do we look to redefine processes that are not about what makes it easier for government, but that are about the user experience? Um, and I, I know that's kind of a, a, a buzzwordy term that we hear a lot about in the context of tech, but when we think about the user experience in government, what we're really thinking about is how do we think about residents' needs and experiences at the core and bring empathy into the work. Um, so more, uh, you know, whether it's a processy, whether it's the structure of a form, can we get to that really granular level that starts to infuse this, um, this notion of shifting the way that we approach the types of services that we deliver within the state? And I think we've, um, and we've been making some strides in Rhode Island. I've seen some great work happening in other states to that effect, particularly around using behavioral science to understand how people want to engage or what's more likely to get a response um, in a certain, some great work in New York City around subpoenas um, for you know paying unpaid parking tickets and how to redesign that process. In our Government Innovation League, we actually um, have brought in a whole host of behavioral scientists and, and folks who help us rethink and restructure um, the way we communicate with parents when their kids aren't showing up to school and how to or the way that we might use text messages to alert people of information instead of sending forms in government lingo that are boring to read, no one wants to read, and, and people might not understand. So how can we think about meeting residents in a way that's more meaningful to the way that they interact rather than um, what's on a government timeline? And I think that's part of the way that when you meet people where they are, you start to change that perception that government is out of touch, is ineffective, um, and you can help make moves towards, towards really shifting that narrative. How, how should we be communicating differently with, with parents when their kids uh, are in school? I mean. I mean, it's an interesting example. I'm wondering if do you have the next level of detail about how that actually works. So you're going to have to check back in with me because one of that's one of the projects happening okay. right now in our government innovation league. But things like um, the text messaging, uh, text for baby is a um, I think out of New Jersey is a way that they used to communicate with new mothers about um, checking in with respect to their first week out of the hospital right. um, and, and things of that nature. And can we take the, the ways that parents are used to hearing information um, that's not just the form in the backpack that's probably not gonna make it to you? So I'm gonna go to the audience in a little while for questions, but does anybody have any additions on this particular topic? Uh, you can disagree with the premise that people are like disgusted with government. Uh, and I, I don't wanna, I'm not making that as a blanket statement, but it's clear that there's some of that. Do you, any of you have a perspective on what government should be doing differently to sort of change that narrative? Yes. Thank you. Thanks for all the comment. This just thought crossed my mind, and I thought for the sake of discussion, I would throw it out there. Because I hear this all the time about uh, people are fed up with government or government's broken. and. I wonder if our democracy and forms of government are broken or whether the people who are supposedly enacting the government in our democracy are failing to actually um, bring about government as we hope it should be. Or 
I wonder if we as a people, as constituents of that government, are really failing government, whether it's people on the inside of government who are not doing their uh, public duty or whether it's us out here that aren't doing our duty. I just, that thought crossed my mind when you, when you, when you, when you yeah. I don't know. Here you go. So uh, I brought up the health insurance exchange in Rhode Island before the new governor came in. We were uh, tied in that three-way Connecticut, Rhode Island, Kentucky uh, arena. And um, I think that one of the issues that doesn't get discussed when we talk about these things, and I think the, you were the director of finance in Kentucky. General, oh, general counsel. Oh, you're the director of finance, I'm sorry. That's okay. One of the things that doesn't get discussed is one of the reasons that we're in silos, and it's not unique to the public sector, it's, it's just as rampant in the private sector. Large co corporate companies in the private sector have exactly the same problems and they have exactly the same trust issues with their customers. Um, it's metrics and budgets and what people are measured on in terms of outcomes. So innovation is a great thought, but when innovation happens, it's disruptive. Mm -hmm. When it disrupts, so in our case, 40% of the market shifted to another insurer because we actually gave information to consumers. And that had ramifications in a variety of different ways, politically and, and otherwise. Um, the budgets and how we structure our budgets uh, have huge implications in what you can and can't in innovate. It's not just procurement, mm -hmm. it's also how, how the money flows. And so I think we do ourselves a disservice unless we connect all of those things. I don't think people are disgusted with government. I think people are disgusted <laughs> with the way the whole system works. And nobody knows quite who to blame, and so they lash out. But we don't respect in gov government, we don't respect people. A lot of government operates just as corporate, um, large corporations operate or insurance companies, whatever. We don't respect that people have the ability to um, work their way through information if we give them the right support. And I think you have to tie those things together. So I. I kind of agree and disagree to a certain extent, but I don't think you can have this conversation without looking at how the budgets and the money flows. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else want to comment? Go ahead. And, and I'm just going to add, I don't think people know how to trust government. <clears throat> the issue of trust is, I think, very important to most everyone, whether it's a relationship or whether it's with another. And I think government, as it presents itself, is this thing that we're all, as citizens, learning to trust. And trust, as we know, is a highly complex thing. Mm -hmm. And so maybe figuring out what are the, the subtle ways that government can be um, more trustworthy. And I think that's, that's something that comes with um, people learning to be authentic and, and vulnerable. And I think government could could work on being a little more trustworthy. Thank you. Well, and also I would think following through on what you commit to do. I mean, you earn trust when you, you know, you make a commitment, you run a campaign, you tell them you're going to do something, and then it helps if you do it. It's one, it's one way to earn some trust. I don't know if either of you want to add anything to that. Well, for the particular project I was talking about, which is Kentucky Wired, you know, this was something that was different than the normal day-to-day -day for, for the Finance and Administration Cabinet because a lot of what we did was we ran, you know, we collected taxes and we ran the facilities and we issued the debt and this is a business of, of state government. It was very, uh, and I think that's opaque to a lot of people. And, you know, unless you're in it every day, you're not going to understand that. And so I do understand why that can be frustrating. I get frustrated with government agencies as well, right? We all have to go to the DMV. But for this particular project, we knew there was going to be an issue. We had a Democratic governor, we had a Republican uh, congressman, and even within state government, we had a lot of different silos where people were able to purchase their own internet access. And so this was going to change and disrupt all of that, just like you were saying. It was, it was innovative, but it was very disruptive. And so we slowed that down and really invited everybody that might have any kind 
of stake in what we were doing. Every IT person from every university, every agency, every large uh, city, um, this, this collection of small cities, anybody that might be interested, we invited them to be a part of every single piece of that. And I really think that that really helped because and then people were afraid we were still having meetings without them. So we w took the extra step of just inviting the world, basically, and, and that was very helpful. I don't know if you can do that on everything that you do. I think, but I think, Lori, to your point, the notion of how do you cast a really broad net, and I'm sorry, I can't read your name tag, but um, to your point about trust, to just reflect on that a little bit, you you can't get anyone to work with you if they don't have some base level of, of trust, whether it's that you're gonna follow through or you're going to uphold a certain set of ideals. Um, and I think that's so foundational and core in, in the vulnerability piece that you mentioned. So one thing that my office um, does is we work on a minimally viable product sort of six month timeline. So if we start a project and we don't have a proof of concept within six months, um, we'll say how do we need to shift or pivot? How do we move on? I think that's really foundational because I, there's definitely a frustration that if you, um, you know, we, we, we will never admit that we're wrong, we'll never admit that we need to shift or pivot, and we'll continue to go down a track that isn't, hasn't brought in the right people, isn't relevant, isn't feeling meaningful um, in the work that we're doing. And I think if you can tie that sense of, of almost metacognition that you don't, you have subject matter experts in the room, you've pulled people together, but there might be a point when you have to acknowledge there's some things that we don't know and we need to go through this collaborative learning process. I think that's why you know the effort that Lori's talking about is a really great way to think about how do we um, not only try to get the right people in the room, but also understand who might not be in the room and, and make efforts to bring them into that space. Um, and that's, you know, if we have time later, I'm, I'm happy to talk about some of the projects that we've done in Rhode Island that, that I think have made great strides towards that effort. But um, I think whether you're working in healthcare or education or, um, or at the DMV, without trust and without a sense, um, you're, n you're not going to accomplish anything. Yeah. I just, I want to add one thing to that. I think this, this, this issue of trust is interesting and uh, the way that you all followed up is as well. And the, the best analogy that I can have, we, we made um, improving the, the prospects of foster kids a, a, a major priority item while I was governor. And the foster kids had an expression, nothing about us without us, which meant that, you know, the idea that there were a bunch of adults who were going to be sitting in a room somewhere making all these decisions about, you know, school, work, transportation, housing, for these foster kids, particularly the ones who were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, didn't make a lot of sense. And so, uh, to her credit, one of the judges in Delaware, uh, probably nine, ten years ago, created what they called the, the Youth Advisory Committee. And I met with them a number of times. And they were so much more bought in when they had a chance to participate and to be, to be part of it. So I, I, I do think that, that extends that should extend to a lot of places beyond foster kids. And it really gets to your point, and I mean, I think your question about whether the failure is less within government than on the citizen side, is that, is, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, well, I think it's an, it's, an interest, it's an interesting question. I mean, what I would say is there's no question we get the government that we deserve. And when people, you know, participate in democracy and they vote and they hold their elected officials accountable, then they're likely to get a better government. And if they don't, and if people don't turn out to vote, then you find a bunch of idiots elected. And, you know, this is, you know, this is sort of at all, at all levels. And so I think it's... On the one hand, it's hard to put the failing on the part of the population because people are busy. I mean, people are busy raising their kids, taking care of elderly parents, working two or three jobs to put food on the table. But there is a basic responsibility that goes with being a, a, a vibrant democracy as well. Let me switch. Uh, go ahead. And then I'm going to switch topics. I'm taking Eric's job of handing the microphone to everybody. Uh, I think that 
that we're missing, there's an elephant in the room here. When you're talking about trust or the lack of trust to government, it's a fundamental tenet, you know, and I'm gonna get partisan here for a second, um, uh, always, but the, that the Republican Party for 40 years, from at least Reagan, if not earlier, is as basic tenet has been government is bad, it's incompetent, individuals can do better, and therefore, and, and the media has picked it up, particularly more conservative elements of newspapers or, or Fox News, and it is a basic tenet that government doesn't work, it's incompetent, it doesn't care about you, and, and that's what we, everybody has to fight against. You can do a good job, you know, or you can do a good job on bringing, you know, fiber optics to, to, to there, but the news media will focus on if there's a cost overrun somewhere. And they are. And, and, you know, or what will happen is, is that there will be some, somebody that screws up in the bureaucracy, and it's, it continues this narrative that government is bad. That's a fundamental element or fissure between the two parties. Democrats think government can work. Okay, doesn't always work well, and there's sometimes it, it's government shouldn't do that. But I believe it's a basic tenet there, and we have to fight that every single day. And, and the second part of it is, is that I would say government also is not always consumer friendly. It, it, it goes out of its way in, in its employees and its interaction with people to make it feel like let's make it as painful as possible to get a license or to deal with something with the bureaucracy. And I just had a recent experience that was bizarre in a positive way when I took a car in for service. The technology exists for this, but when you go pick up your car, you pay for it and no one knows what the hell you did with it, really. I got a text on my phone to tell me to go pick it up from the technician a video a piece that said, this is exactly what we did to your car. Well, why in the hell don't you, if you got technology exists, why doesn't government, when they come back with something, as simple as that, so you had a positive experience. But those were just two observations I had. Well, thank you, and I think that second uh, thing in particular is very much related to what Octavia talked about with respect to the, having the, um, what do you call those, uh, it's like the behavioral, Behavioral science, so yeah, the text for baby, yeah. 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 Okay, let me, I want to switch topics. Um, and the, the, the question I want to ask is, what are, I mean, we're at this point in time, I talked about a couple of the big issues. If all we do is keep the trains running on time, so let, let's say we deal with your issue and we get more customer friendly, and we do that, and th that's fine. And there would be, you know, it'd be an improvement in the public's perception of how government's operating because we're building these fiber projects on budget and on time, and you know, people go into the DMV and they're very happy. That's positive. But you know, my view is, you know, keeping the trains running on time is necessary, but insufficient. We've got to be anticipating the major societal forces at work. Uh, that's sort of going to change the whole nature of government, which is something that Eric has really been writing about and thinking about for a couple decades now. But I'd like to start with the two of you. Keep the answers brief, uh, and then I want to get, I want to ask you all as well, what, what are the major issues that we need to be thinking about so that we're not just keeping the trains running on time, but that we've got in 10 and 20 years, uh, we, we're, we, we, we're, we're making, people are more prosperous than they are today. And I think at the end of the day, that's really, I think why most of us run for office is because we believe we can, you know, make changes in our own jurisdiction so that there's more prosperity, you know, 10 years from now than there, than there is today. So it, big issues that we ought to be focused on that we're not. Uh, so that's a great question. How do you, you know, how do you predict the future? I found, I was in state government in probably five or six different agencies, and I found that most of the things that we did which were good going forward came from the people in the agencies. 
they already really knew what we should be doing next. They would continue to do the normal activities to keep the trains running on time, but if you ask them what they thought was coming, they, they knew the people and the subject matter, and really the people at the top should listen to them. I also think that education and just thinking about our workforce is such a, you spoke to it, Governor, just a, such a core foundational piece. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in Rhode Island around our workforce ecosystem and also how do we um, build the skills of the future starting in kindergarten for students around computer science. So we launched an initiative and we are on track to have Rhode Island be the first state in the country that's offering computer science in every one of our public schools from K to 12. Um, so how do we build those skills with an eye to having students be creators, not just consumers of technology, and able to engage um, in a new space, in a new medium, um, and, and really rethink about the commitment that we make as government, as a society, that getting, getting you through a high school diploma might not be enough for those jobs of the future, isn't enough for the jobs of the future, and what's our commitment as a community to make sure that you have the capacity and the opportunity to engage in that space? Okay. All right. How about any of you? What is it? Yep. Restate the question you think I asked. Okay. So additional things we need to be focusing on. Instead of just targeting the status quo, where should we be focusing? Yes. I am paying attention. My name is Lauren Visk. Um, I work in global mental health. And I think um, I may be a bit biased, but I think having the technological innovation in schools is so important. But I also think access to healthcare, um, healthcare education, which there's so many innovations bringing um, like mobile-based learning and mental health promotion apps. Um, but I think really focusing on teaching kids the skills to one, navigate conflict in their life, which is inevitable through nonviolence or mindfulness training or um, general community building activities, but really focusing on the underlying um, health equity and access. Without that, kids aren't able to go to school um, and they encounter many challenges, so. I'm glad you raised that. For me, you know, I, uh, one of the big eye openers is I visited, I think, probably all of our schools. We have about 220 schools in Delaware. I probably visited all of them during my time as governor. And the, the biggest issue that I would hear about from teachers and principals were the unmet mental health needs of their students. And unfortunately, uh, those needs are going to younger and younger students. And the trauma that so many of these kids have to deal with uh, in their, not just in their homes, but in their communities in terms of violence and the like. And I think it's, I think it's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else? Big, big yes, Andrew. No, as I can say, I'm gonna make a career out of agreeing with you. Um, in the beginning, you said one of the existential threats is the choice that companies can make about how they hire and fire. And I just wanted to kind of maybe reframe the question or, or ask you, what do you think about Amazon and their second headquarters? Like one way to think about it is like, this is a much more existential threat to government. They're basically about to choose how they want to be governed. They're choosing how they want to be taxed. Um, that's the challenge of the future, I think. Do, would either of you like to take a crack at that and then I will do so? So Rhode Island, I don't know what Kentucky's um, process looked like, but um, so Rhode Island just put in an, ap an application um, or, and, or responded to the proposal. And I think um, the way that we, we're thinking about creating more opportunities for all Rhode Islanders um, in the high tech space um, and also in marine and advanced manufacturing and cybersecurity and, you know, across all of our ecosystem investments. Um, and I think your question about Amazon we're thinking of it more as how do we create not only opportunities for Rhode Islanders, but how do we create the space to partner in new ways? Um, so, you know, any any companies coming in are going to be a part of the same laws. They're going to be part of um, you, they're going to be part of the ecosystem in Rhode Island um, or any state that Amazon and should choose to go to. Um, but but I think the question for me is more how do we 
how do we think about structuring new relationships and partnering with industry in a different way? Can we bring them into the conversation around workforce development to train um, train work the workforce with the skills that they need when they're looking to hire? So they choose to hire Rhode Islanders first, or or whatever you know whatever state is working in this space. Can we um, think about when we go out to bid? How do we use more RFIs, requests for information, rather than jumping to the RFP, so we can understand more about what's in the landscape um, to to get a better product for the citizens of our state? How do we think about shifting, you know, and not just running into strictly a vendor relationship, really trying to bring in the, the threads of partnership in a more meaningful way so that we can get ultimately get a better product for our citizens? Laura, do you want to add anything? Well, Louisville also responded to um, the RFP. And um, it's kind of ironic since I'm sitting here talking about our low connectivity, you know, and everything, and, and bringing a large company like that in. But we are uh, very skilled at logistics. And um, of course, we have the UPS hub there. So uh, for our, from our perspective, it was just too good of a possibility. You know, there, it would be a game changer. We'd, we wouldn't really even know what it would be like, uh, obviously, to have something that big. But when you think about that many number of jobs that are paying six figures, it's just too much to not put your hat in the ring. So uh, I have a very particular point of view about this, and if you'd like to read more, I had an op-ed in the New York Times about uh, three weeks ago on this topic. Is that why you asked the question? Or? Please tell me. Uh, okay. So first of all, um, I have to preface this by saying I, as governor, was as guilty as anybody at playing this game. Because, and, and the game being the offering of public incentives to encourage employers to set up shop in your state. I didn't like it, but I didn't feel like I had any chance because the truth is, I'm not prepared. I was not prepared to compete with one or both arms tied behind my back. It's a really, it's a bad, it's not, this is not good for the taxpayers because what we ought to be doing is not competing on the basis of who can write the bigger check, who can give the biggest tax incentive. We ought to be competing based on quality of schools, quality of workforce, quality of life, quality of infrastructure, those kinds of things. We ought to be making investments that will be to the benefit of all of our employers and all of our people. But as long as there was one governor who was not willing to you know, make that their focus, then the rest of the governors are gonna have to play ball because there's no question the power has shifted to the employers. They hold the power. And, and I don't think anybody, and, and I think this Amazon thing is demonstrating this in spades. And if I were still governor, I'd be playing the game too, even though I think it's a lousy game to play because I'm just, I'm not prepared again to sort of lose, lose this opportunity. So my, you know, how do you fix it? I don't know. I, the proposal I made in this New York Times piece was that Congress ought to tax, the federal government ought to tax at 100% every incentive that goes directly into a company's coffers. You know, I'm not talking about in investments in transportation infrastructure. I'm not talking about workforce development programs. But if it's just going to the bottom line of a particular company, it's just it's a it's a lousy game and it's a you know um, it's a zero sum game. So that that is my particular view. I think it's an interesting question. I think and sort of related to that, less about Amazon. But I'm thinking, I don't know about you. I took an Uber to get here tonight. I don't know if any of you you know probably some of you took Uber or Lyft. It's like unbelievably convenient, but you talk about employers that are sort of like dictating how they want to be governed. And I, I, and I did the same thing with them. Because I, the, I had all the business people in Wilmington, you know, we're trying to attract a lot of young people to, you know, just as I'm sure, you know, your, your big jurisdictions are, trying to get a lot of young people to move in. Uh, they all want Uber and Lyft. And I, tell, I feel so badly every time I go to the Wilmington train station, the taxi drivers say, Governor, and I go over and talk to them, and, and, and they, they have nothing left because you know, they, they, you know, they've, they've lost all their business, and they're governed differently. They, don't have, they have more stringent security requirements and the like, and so I, 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 I want to raise the question, what, what, should government be doing something differently when, to your, to your point, these, um, these, these companies are sort of dictating how they want to be governed. And I think, you know, in particular, when it comes to that kind of opportunity. Does, does anybody want to add, go ahead. So when you take that, yeah. you match it up with what you said at the very beginning. Yeah. About artificial intelligence and the fact that the corporate world is using that, 
right? And then you look at government and innovation in government and what the exchange is. Here's the big hampering uh, factor or the barrier for government is that we don't think about how to use that same technology to balance what's going on. So you, you mentioned quality of life, um, education, school. That's not what's programmed or built into the way that, not necessarily, the way that uh, an entity outside of government is looking at it. Why are we not using the same tools to, to match? And we don't do it because we don't feel like we can justify the expense, or we don't do it because we don't feel like we know enough about it, or how to use the data, third party. There's a million different ways we can combat uh, insurance rates, right? We don't need underwriters. There's lots of other technology that insurance companies use, but we don't get access to it. We can, but that requires a level of innovation that's beyond the technologies that we've talked about. So how do you balance that? Yes, he's, he's going to go and he's going to reduce the number of employees, again, through artificial intelligence. But his mechanism and his goals are very different than your goals as governor. Why, oh. can't, why can't we match those two things together? OK. What we're seeing, unfortunately, at a global level is that the 20th century model dominated by the United States is gradually, when it comes to growth and expansion, is gradually being substituted by centralized, somewhat authoritarian models, which unfortunately are proving themselves to be more successful in the eyes of large parts of the world. Um, so we have, uh, my long-term belief is that democratic models and institutions are inevitably superior but in the meantime, we lose. And so you, what we really need to do is reinforce the meaning behind and the power of democratic institutions. Use technology, take the examples of Estonia, some of the Scandinavian governments, create flatness, transparency, really demonstrate the power of democratic institutions in terms of distribution of rights and economic benefit to a population against this model that is being deployed centrally by these very, very powerful, long-term totalitarian regimes who can take a 20-year worldview and just tell society how it will operate and derive tangible benefits, certainly in economic terms, which means that nobody's going to substitute them. Nobody's going to look to replace them. I would tell them to offer leadership and demonstrate why the democratic process and its institutions is superior. And you do that by acting in practice. As I said, make engagement with government more transparent, simpler, better, create momentum. Well, that's not a very provocative statement. Um, thank you. Do you guys want to respond to that? No? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot in there, and I'm not going to speak to the <laughs> um, I'm not going to speak to the international powers at play um, because I don't think we have time in this conversation. But um, to your point about transparency and how do we think about making sure that the that we're not only incentivizing the type of behavior that we want to see um, within our systems, but also creating a culture towards the certain ends that we want to drive at. I think that's a for me, that's a critical piece of how do we make sure that it's a more participatory type of environment. Eric. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay, Lori. Okay. Eric? Yeah, I, I want to pick up on, uh, let's see if my mic's working here. Yeah. I, I want to pick up on what Max said and kind of challenge what you said. You, you're, you're both presenting, uh, you, you love this already, I can tell. Um, you, you're both presenting what's essentially a prisoner's dilemma model of the world, right? And Jack, your argument was, uh, you know, I know it's wrong, but when I'm governor, I couldn't help myself because we all have to do this. And, you know, in Amazon, this whole Amazon competition 
is, uh, you know, I think in most people's mind, proving that that's the case. You know, we all have to succumb to this because look, everybody's succumbing. I, I think the Amazon competition uh, is just so bad and so over the top that it's pretty much proving the other point. Is, um, I, I hate to break it to Octavia, but I'll, I'll, I'll bet you 100 to 1 odds Rhode Island's not getting, I hate to tell you this, <laughs> I don't care what you do, Rhode Island is not getting uh, Amazon HQ2. Um, there, there have been these you know, detailed analyses in the Times and the Post about you know, who are they going to choose. The Post has this great thing going now. They've set up like NCAA brackets. <laughs> have you seen that? You, know, you can choose. You know, it's between Denver and Philadelphia and Toronto and Syracuse. <laughs> you know, and then they, they advance to the and they're doing this whole competition for the country to choose who is Am Amazon going to choose. But the, the thing with this competition is you know, virtually everybody in the room can go through this. You know, they've narrowed it to you know, it's like the, 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 the 32 or something. I think they, they cut it down to. Everybody in this room, I don't care how informed or not informed you think you are, you can go through this bracket and probably narrow it down to the final four, just as the Times and the Post have done. It's pretty obvious where it's going to go. I don't care if Omaha says we'll never tax you for as long as you exist. They're not putting the headquarters in Omaha. It's just not going to happen. There's a couple of places that are the finalists for this, no matter what happens. And they're not the finalists because of the tax breaks. They're the finalists because of exactly the opposite of the tax breaks. They're the finalists because Amazon has said very much what, what they want. I mean, it's, you know, it's like an RFP for you, you. You get us if you do these things. And part of it's, you know, of course, we want tax breaks. But on top of that, you know, we want one of the world's great airports. We want to have an incredibly great highway system and public transportation system that will take workers from all over the region, our headquarters, and to the airport. Um, we want to have you know, an incredibly great college system that's going to feed us thousands and thousands of really highly educated people to fill these $100,000 a year jobs for the next 30 years. And they have all these specifications. And there's only a couple cities that, that meet those specifications. And you know, they meet those specifications because they have said over the years, you know, we're going to invest in having a really great education system. We're going to invest in having a really great transit infrastructure. They, they, they've made investments as govern, governments and as communities in the kinds of things that are attracting Amazon. The rest of this is all a sideshow. So if you want to know what Amazon really shows you, it's, you know, if, if, you, if you're Omaha instead of Chicago, you might as well forget it because you can give all the tax breaks you want in the world. They're not, they're not going there. They're going to a couple of cities, and you can probably more or less guess which one or two are going to be the finalists in this. And it's because it's because they've made the investments. So you know, I think that this this lie that we've seen for decades that governments have to be forced into this position is just plain wrong. Now, if I were governor of Delaware, I think. God, I wasn't. You were instead. You know, uh, you're you're going to be stuck in that position because you know ultimately Wilmington's not going to be one of the ones that, that gets it either. So you're going to be uh, trying to get them to come because you're offering all these tax breaks. But eventually, that's not going to be the decision. They're making their decision based on the investments that we want to see governments making. So you know, how do you get out of this box? I think it's you know, on a domestic level, the same sort of thing that Max is talking about. The the you know, humans consistently make poor short-term choices that are against our long-term interests. But, but ultimately, companies like Amazon and countries that are succeeding are succeeding because they, they know what the right answer is. They know how to survive long-term. And yeah, they're perfectly happy to go around the margins to see where they can, you know, yeah, sure, we're probably going to, you know, it's going to be between uh, you know, Denver and, and um, Boston, you know, and let's see if we can get a little bit extra out of them. But that's not the basis on which these decisions are being made. So as governments and as communities and as societies, don't make decisions to offer that, you know? Um, I mean, essentially, we have, a, we have a choice as a community to say, we're going to take a high road, we're going to take a low road. We're going to make investments instead of saying, we're going to stand out on a street corner and say, you know, I'll work for the cheapest amount possible. Please give me a lousy job. That's not what anybody says. And we don't have to say that as a community. We don't have to say that as a society. And that is, in fact, the winning answer if you just have the fortitude to stick with it. So, you know, what do you do as governor of Delaware? Well, yeah, I mean, you pretty much do what, what you did. You realize you're, you're, you're probably not going to win the HQ2 competition. You do what, what Gina's trying to do. Say, this is a long-term thing we're going to have to make. It's not about tax giveaways. We're going to 
raise the educational levels of our people. We're going to create an infrastructure that has a great higher ed system that keeps feeding people into it. We're going to build the, the roads and airports and ports that connect us up to the economy. We're going to make those investments because in, in, in the same way that everybody knows that you know, we're, you're, you're not going to get ahead by taking the cheapest job you can get. You're going to get ahead by making investments in your own educational capital and move ahead. You make those decisions as a society, that's how you eventually get there. And it's, you know, it's not necessarily easy, but that's what, that's what good, good governors like you do, it's what Gina does. You know, that, that is the future. And I don't think we're stuck in this um, uh, prisoner's dilemma unless we choose to be and keep making stupid decisions like that. All right, thank you. That was, that was a, a, an excellent summary. Uh, we've got time for like one more comment. So do uh, how many how many Brown students are actually here? Raise your okay. All right, one, one of you guys has to say something. <laughs> it's your future. Yeah, it's your future. Yeah, exactly. Oh, come on. The, r the real question is, what role do you think young students can play? So, so, so I, I wasn't actually invite, I wasn't inviting a question. I was inviting a comment, and I think you've asked a great question for you all to comment on. Well, I'll try to answer my own question. Excellent. Um, so I think that it's a lot easier for you people that have real lives and jobs, professions, to be able to facilitate these kinds of interactions. And even though the attendance of the Brown students was extremely poor tonight, there are a lot of us that are really passionate about these issues and finding the avenues to kind of reach out and, um, and get us involved is, is, I don't know, really helpful and exciting, but um, I guess, I think this is like a different kind of time that, than any of us have exactly seen, so even though this is supposed to be a comment, I think I would like to hear some answers um, in terms of how, because I, I do think this is a different time. I think we're dealing with something different than we have dealt with in the past, so really how can we rise to the challenge and how can we meet these obstacles that have not been met before, and it's not gonna happen unless there is useful, productive coordination between different generations and different groups of people that are able to do different things. So if we can start the foundation here at the conference for building that kind of collaboration, that will be a great start, but how can we um, continue these conversations, I guess? A question and a comment. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's difficult to be frustrated when you're engaged in pursuing your passion. Um, so if there are opportunities for young people to pursue what they're passionate about and engage on a level that they're innovating on, so like young people have a different concept of technology, different concept of education, of ideals, of politics than other generations do, and I think um, by providing them opportunities to innovate, and by providing them opportunities to pursue what they're passionate about, there'll be a lot less frustration and a lot more engagement. So I'm actually going to take the prerogative, since I have the microphone, of having the last word. Um, I want to thank Octavia, you and Lori both very much. Let's hear it for the two of them. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to use my last word to, res what's, what's your name? Isabel. Isabel. So, uh, my view is that it's not just about people providing you those opportunities, but it's about you seizing those opportunities and creating them. And Andrew will confirm this to be true. When I, in, in uh, 
in like late 2007, early 2008, and as I said, I was in this very tight race for governor that I was not supposed to win, and I had the advantage of about 50 or 60 high school students who decided to embrace my campaign. And we had them over to our house. I, I assume you were there. We had, uh, we had water ice. I'll never forget, we had water ice. And as these students left, my wife said to me, she said, if you win, it's going to be because of them. Because they, they, they were willing to take a chance on me and to invest in what they were very mission driven and they thought this was a cause. And they were willing to take a chance on me in a way that like adults in the party infrastructure were not. And it's exactly what happened. I sort of rode on their coattails. And so I will, um, do you know who the singer John Mayer is? So he's got this song, it's uh, called Waiting on the World to Change, you know that song? It's a great song, but it's exactly the wrong message. You can't be waiting on the world to change. You gotta go change the world. And so I think it is great that, you know, Eric, you know, reached out and provided these kinds of, uh, th this opportunity. But my advice is, uh, you know, hopefully you're coming back tomorrow and you're gonna talk to like all the people who are here and get their business cards. And the ones that are, you know, are doing something that's interesting to you, that you find interesting, go say, well, can I, can I help you with it? Or like find something that you really care about and go make it happen. I mean, I know we, for 30 years in Delaware, they tried to get statewide recycling done. We could never get it done. We had one of the worst uh, statewide recycling rates in the country. And uh, shortly before I was elected, this 12-year-old girl came up to me and like she pinned me. She was, we were at an event and she like, she said, I need to talk to you. She was literally 12 years old. And she, t she took me into the corner of this room with all these people and she said, it's terrible that we, have so that we don't do any recycling. And she ended up coming down, once I was elected, she came to Dover and she met with all these legislators and she brought a, young, a, a bunch of young friends with her. And like a month later, we had passed statewide recycling. And it was because she was 12 years old. And so I really do think you can make an unbelievable difference and I, I, I liked what you said, you can't be frustrated if you're working on something you're passionate about. So find something you're passionate about and go make it happen. So with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Eric for right, closing thank, comments. Thank, th th thanks, Jack. Oh, you Sorry. Have, you have your <laughs> Laura, you wanna say something? So, well, I was just gonna add that it would be really interesting if the student's passion perhaps were converted into fighting against gerrymandering and uh, to get money out of politics and also to vote because obviously you could have great voter turnout and you'd still have that gerrymandering issue, but voter turnout would help. But gerrymandering would be huge because you, you're talking about governors who want to help do uh, programs that would help the public. Well, we don't have that in a lot of the country. Like uh, where we are, the governor is not interested in any of the better roads or jobs or all that. It's, he's interested in shrinking the government. And, but that is because of gerrymandering. In other words, a small a minority of people are able to put him into office because you'll see a majority vote in our state for national elections for, say, a Democrat, and yet 90% of the legislature is Republican. So it's not actually the will of the people there. So under, I guess there's just something undergirding all of this that if you've got this system being held up by gerrymandering, until that goes away, we're, we're talking about symptoms rather than the cause. So. Well, thanks. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for our panelists. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exer exercise the uh, prerogative that Jack thought he was exercising of having the last word. Um, but, but I'm going to be real brief because uh, we're, we're, we're going to adjourn. We're going to be back here tomorrow. I just want to say something about, about tomorrow and where we're going with this. Um, Jack and Lacey said, said kind of similar things that I wanted to pick up on about, uh, about the future and moving forward. And that we're in a, an important uh, flex point in history. And I think, you know, when, when you're your age, you know, we all think this is like the most important moment in history. Um, because you haven't seen it before, you know, but I think we are living at a time that we haven't seen before, that this is one of the most important times in, in hundreds of years of human history, that there's gonna be tremendous change over the next couple of decades in, in everything, and that's why, that's why we're here, that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, Jack talked about this song, which thankfully I don't know, because I don't know any John Mayer. 
um, except that I know he's supposed to be a heel. But um, uh, so this this song, uh, what was it, waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. Yeah, but you know, I mean, that's the thing. You, you neither can nor have to wait for the world to change because it is in fact changing. And what we're here to talk about is the fact that there, there are these changes that have happened already, they're happening now, they're accelerating. And the question is, you know, what do we need to do to catch up with that? And it's transforming the nature of, of government and society and, you know, and, and then uh, from that, uh, the nature of what those of you who are in this room here uh, committed to trying to do something to make a positive difference, what's that environment in which you can operate and how can you make a difference? And that's what we're gonna be talking about um, the rest of the time that we're here. Uh, so, um, as anecdotally, you know, I mentioned that, um, you know, I, mean, I really do think Jack is one of the best governors we've had in, in my lifetime. Not like he's got a lot of competition, but in fact, he has been one of the best, one of the best governors that we've had. Um, I was uh, sitting around a couple of weeks ago with uh, friends of ours from, from, from college, and um, we got to talking about this, and somehow um, I, I wound up saying that, uh, you know, I'd read a thing a number of years ago about Bill Clinton. I don't know if this is going to turn out to be true about Clinton, but you know when he when he started the Clinton Foundation, and there was a, a uh, an article I think in the Atlantic about how you know he, he he may potentially transform philanthropy, and the article concluded with this line about how you know who knows maybe a hundred years from now, um, Bill Clinton will be remembered as uh, one of the world's great philanthropists who also happened to have been president of the United States at some time. Uh, which, which I think says something about how it's likely to be 100 years from now with the relative importance of finding ways outside of government to do good and actually having been even President of the United States, how these things will stack up somewhere down the road. And uh, I made a comment similar to that, that you know, my guess is, and, and I can see this already in what Jack's been doing in the couple months since he's out of office, that um, as good a governor as I think he was, my guess is that um, someday, you know, decades and decades from now, we both hope at the end of our lives, Jack is going to be looking back and saying, you know, the most significant thing I did with my life is not what I did as, as governor of Delaware, even though I think he did a lot of significant things. It's, it's, it's going to be the things that he's doing from, from here on, because that's the nature of the, the, the shift uh, that's going on today. And th these friends of mine were kind of amazed that I said that, both because uh, they're, they're huge fans of Jack's and they know, you know, I've spent my life in government and politics, and so how can I be saying a thing like that? So I said, well, think about it this way. Uh, you know, your kid's interested in being a writer. Would, I hate to, you know, you're nodding along. <laughs> I, mean, I hate to say this here. I said, well, you know, would you tell your kid to, to go work for a newspaper today? And of course the answer is no. Nobody in their right mind would tell their child to go work. You know, you want a job as a newspaper journalist. That's the future. It's not the future. And I don't think if you want to make a difference in the world, the thing you want to do, uh, you know, is tell, tell your kid to grow up to be a governor. Uh, you know, that's, that's not where it's going to be. So where, where is it going to be? Because we're used to thinking of, you know, government's the power structure. Government is the big lever where you can get things done. I don't think most of the younger people in the room today quite think this way, but, you know, when we were young, if you're, you're gonna go out and make a difference, you know, uh, you, you went into government-related fields. That's why I became a lawyer. That's why I was interested in politics, certainly why Jack went into politics. It's where, where you could, could make a difference because government is, you know, what you did to make a difference. Very few of us, I think, feel that that's the place to make a difference. I think the, the, the young people in this room particularly feel that way. Um, so what does that mean? What, what does it mean that you can do? How, what are the channels for change? That's what we're going to be talking about for the remainder of this conference. That's why we have this conference here to begin with. Uh, it's, it's how we originated the discussion that led to this conference. So uh, I hope to some degree that puts in perspective for you what we're going to be talking about the remainder of the time here. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to kind of pick up that on that theme and give you a little bit more background on, on the, the thinking that brought this conference into being. And then we're going to hear from uh, Martin Luther King III. Um, we'll, we'll have some further discussion about um, uh, some, some of the points that Max was raising about uh, the larger issue of not just government per se, but, but democracy itself and where that's headed as a re result of technological and economic and social change in the world and, and what, kind of, um, what kind of hope do we have uh, for democratic governance. Um, we're going to go from there to talking about uh, at a deeper level the, the changes that technology is bringing in the world and we're lucky to have um, uh, Kala Vitaro, who was here a moment ago, but I guess he's not here now, um, who's one of the world's great experts on this, will be talking with us. Uh, the latter part of the day, we're going to be shifting into uh, these uh, channels for making a difference outside of the public sector. And I think it'll be really the highlight of, of our time here. We've got a half dozen um, entrepreneurs who are or just recently ceased to be Brown students. Uh, I think two graduated in the past year and four of them currently are undergrads. We're really doing amazing things. 
um, you know, I, I talked with them on putting this, this um, conference together, and I read their bios, and I read their websites of the things they're doing, and, you know, I, I'm, I hate to admit, closing in on three times their age, and you read the stuff they've done, and it, it put, put you to shame. So it's really, really great to have uh, all of these Brown students are going to come here and talk about the things they're doing that are truly changing the world. And we actually have a couple of adults to talk about things that they're doing to change the world, so there's still hope that you can actually do things even uh, uh, when you're over the age of 30. Uh, and we'll close out the day with a discussion from people who are working in a couple of different realms in, um, uh, in, in, in finance, in social venture finance, and um, in um, uh, the, the stuff that, that Greg and Laura have been doing that really is reimagining markets in a different way uh, to look at how uh, how, how the forces of finance and, 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 and markets and non-governmental uh, energy that, that's out there in the world can make a difference for, for those who are even the, are the, the most disadvantaged. And then, of course, as I've told you, we're going to finish off on, on Sunday by looking at all of these things in the, the um, context of one particular issue area, health care reform, that's a big issue right now, and how might that change from the governmental perspective, non-governmental and social venture and so forth over the course of the next couple of decades. And we're going to wrap up both days with a little bit of discussion of, okay, having heard all this stuff, what can we do to make this something that's not just an annual conference, but something that somehow is having a real world effect and moving us forward, really making a difference in the way that I think everybody in this room wants to make a difference. So that's the overview of the conference. Uh, we'll be back here tomorrow morning for, for breakfast early and then uh, to s kick off the day with Martin Luther King III. Uh, between now and then, uh, you can get as much sleep as you choose to, but if you don't choose to sleep, we'll be downstairs at the bar at the um, uh, McCormick and Schmicks and continuing on the conversation a little more informally. Thank you very much for coming and look forward to seeing more of you over the next day and a half. Thank you. Thank you.